Okay, I think we'll commence. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. Um, we've got some distinguished guests um, and obviously members of the profession as well as students and academics. So it's wonderful to have you all here on a very cold Melbourne evening. This is the second in the research seminar series. Uh, we had our first one on the Racial Discrimination Act and four days later the amendments were withdrawn. Say no more. <laughs> Um, so this second seminar is, we're absolutely delighted tonight to have um, Michael McGarvey present on um, the role of the Legal Services Commission. Um, but I'd just like to welcome you first of all and to have our wonderful sponsor, Sladen Legal, say a few words before I present um, Michael. Hello, um, I'm Judy from Sladen Legal. Um, I'd just like to say that we uh, very proud to be a sponsor of the Deakin Research Seminar Series. Um, we've got a long history with Deakin University, so uh, we look forward to seeing the series as it rolls out. Uh, it's fantastic to be affiliated with so many high-level speakers. It's, uh, it's a real honour for us. So we um, yeah, hope you enjoy it and hope you look out for the, the coming speakers as well. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you very much, Slade and Legal, for, for sponsoring this. Um, and I should also mention, thank you to Deacon as well. I'm uh, the acting dean at the moment. I've got emails flying around everywhere at the moment. Um, Samantha Hepburn, if you haven't um, met me, but I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. So I should have introduced myself. Um, okay, now, now on to the important matters. Let's introduce uh, Michael McGarvey. Uh, Michael was appointed uh, to the position of Legal Services Commissioner in December 2009. Prior to this, Michael was the CEO of the Supreme Court of Victoria for three years. Between 1983 and 2006, Michael practised as a solicitor in a private firm. Uh, he primarily specialised in civil litigation over consumer and workplace rights and dispute resolution. Michael is a committed, uh, sorry, excuse me, is committed to preserving existing high standards, of course, um, and independence. Um, among Victoria's legal profession. Uh, he seeks to ensure that complaints about lawyers are dealt with efficiently and fairly, and he will be discussing that in his paper this evening. His, Michael's paper is going to evaluate the role of the Commission, or describe and outline the role of the Commission. Um, he's also going to examine some of the new rules that will be introduced um, in early 2015, and consider how those rules might be exercised um, in a few practical examples. I'd like you all to welcome Michael, um, and I'll present him now. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha and Julia, and uh, and uh, welcome to you all. Uh, um, can I acknowledge um, the presence of Justice Jeffrey Nettle here in the audience, and we're grateful for you being here as well, Judge, and um, uh, when you read out the, um, the objective of the Commissioner, Samantha, dealing with the, um, the standards of the legal profession and my responsibility for upholding them, I try to remind my staff, and I always remind myself, that we, we're upholding the profession's own standards. I'm not imposing my standards or a government standard on the legal profession. This is the regulation of the profession as um, uh, through a statutory office holder, such as myself, and through a board, such as my board. But um, it's the profession's rules, it's the profession's process, and it's the pre profession's own high standards that they want um, regulators to maintain. And if that involves um, booting some people out of the profession, that's exactly what's required. Um, so the... Um, the outline of this presentation really is to describe who we are and what we do. Talk a little bit about some of the new uniform law processes uh, and then give you some case examples about that describe the role that we perform and the, um, and the various elements of regulation that we, that we deal with. Because as a regulator um, in Victoria, we're really two joined together. The Acts creates a 
Legal Services Board and the Act creates a Legal Services Commissioner. And it then says the Commissioner shall be the CEO of the Board. So the board's, the, the, the board's role is slightly different from the Commissioner, but we try to present ourselves as a single regulator because uh, um, it's, it's more effective and it's, it's certainly um, 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 easier to navigate if um, people are assuming they're dealing with um, largely one body. But the Commissioner deals with complaints and education and the board deals with all other aspects of regulation. And I'll take you through some of those in a minute. Um, Aristotle apparently said, um, a wise person knows when to improvise, and most important, a wise person does this improvising in the service of the right aims. The three dots there include another phrase, which uh, on advice I've dropped tonight because it says improvising and rule breaking. And um, it was felt that the, the, that the regulator shouldn't come up here and present to a public uh, audience about rule breaking. But the point that I, I want to make is, in whatever field you operate, particularly as a regulator, the legislation doesn't deliver everything to you. And you can't have everything tested by the Supreme Court to get some sort of a, a finding or a ruling or a direction about how to regulate. There's a whole lot of gaps there are lots of facts and daily concerns that are thrown up that the regulator's got to apply a bit of improvisation and a little bit of confidence to in order to um, make regulation function as it should. So the Commissioner deals with 2,000 complaints a year in Victoria. Um, you'll see the mix of cases that um, most of those complaints, a lot of those complaints relate to family law about 200 probate and estate complaints, 175 complaints and 175 small commercial. Why would the Commissioner be getting complaints in this field and not in others? Are the lawyers in, in this field of law unethical or, or, or um, poorly, um, poorly um, uh, um, servicing their clients? No, this area of law is the, is the area that produces most relationship breaks down, breakdowns in a professional services relationship. And most of the complaints we get are not about fraud, theft, criminality, dishonesty. Most of the complaints, most of those 2,000 complaints a year are about um, delay, communication failure, costs disclosure failure, costs confusion, um, and, and sometimes the relationship is affected by the health of the practitioner. And one of the areas I'll touch on later is about mental health and the impact of um, mental health on the ability of a practitioner to perform. When they're technically competent and they're ethical, they sometimes attract complaints only because their relationship breaks down with their clients. And that's a very important principle for us to remember when we're dealing with complaints. So. We handle complaints, we educate. The sort of two subject matters that we feel are one are about costs and the other is about conduct. And, the, and, and um, once we identified that, um, let's say we're getting 2,000 a year, eight complaints a day, seven of those eight complaints a day have got nothing to do with dishonesty or criminality. Uh, we felt that we needed to apply a process to the, those seven complaints that was not um, as extensive as um, was necessary for the, for, the, for the serious misconduct cases. So we apply a huge amount of, of mediation and conciliation to the vast bulk of the complaints we receive. Uh, we put a lot of effort into being uh, a communicating and accessible regulator where we're meeting and visit, visiting as well as receiving correspondence and dealing um, through paperwork. So that's the Commissioner. The Board, on the other hand, deals with all other aspects of regulation. It's responsible for managing the Public Purpose Fund. We're not funded by government appropriations. We're funded by the interest earned on trust accounts in lawyers' uh, trust, trust um, um, funds, uh, their, their clients' funds in lawyers' trust accounts. And partially by the, the um, certificate fee that's also paid by lawyers to receive a licence every year. 
The board is responsible for oversighting, uh, overseeing the flow of money in and out of trust accounts and uh, when it flows in the wrong direction uh, via a mistake or via, um, via dishonesty, the board is intensely interested in um, dealing with that action by uh, checking the, the activities of the practitioner um, and in many cases compensating the owner of that money who might have lost funds through um, through fraud or dishonesty. And the first case I'll talk to you about later is uh, involving um, Joe Camilleri. Um, I can talk to you about that, um, not because he used to be in Joe Joseph and the Falcons and, um, and in other bands, but because um, his case was publicised recently in the paper involving a fidelity fund claim. Uh, the other role of the of the the board is connected with rulemaking, um, intervening in a dysfunctional firm, putting them into receivership if they're not performing, if the if the owner of the firm or the principal becomes disabled or otherwise is unable to apply um, the pro the proper processes to managing the practice. Most interventions are, are caused by a failure by the practitioner or the practitioners to attend to their affairs or dishonesty offences such as um, defalcations um, of trust money. Uh, licensing and suitability. So the board gives and takes away a license every year um, based on the fitness and propriety of the, propriety of the practitioner and um, it polices um, unqualified practice, that is people who are pretending to be lawyers. So case two I'll talk to you about later involves the consequences of an external intervention, a firm being put into receivership, and case three involves a practitioner, a person who was pretending to be a practitioner but wasn't, um, and d doing so for um, poor old Bob Jane. And the board's responsibility is also to oversee um, the, the way incorporated legal practices and multidisciplinary practices function. Uh, the board also deals with um, supervised legal practice, so anyone who enters the profession must be supervised first um, and is responsible for the continuing professional development process that involves um, um, uh, continuing education for practitioners, even um, those who have been admitted to practice and are, are fully licensed. Um, developing policy, dealing with insurance, managing the finances, managing the public purpose fund, which is not only supports the cost of uh, regulation, but um, deals. Uh, in fact, the public purpose fund is a net funder back to government because the board delivers about twenty-five million dollars a year to Victoria Legal Aid through a formula. And uh, I acknowledge the presence of Megan Keo here tonight. Uh, who um, we work so closely with um, uh, year round. And uh, so financial management, a grant making body, it gives grants to good causes that involve legal need or legal education or other needs. Uh, over the last uh, uh, eight or so years, the board's given uh, over $20 million in grants to major projects involving research or services within courts or support services within communities relevant to legal issues and legal need. And, um, and the, the board's also responsible for auditing um, incorporated legal practices. Um, the commissioner complaint area involves this, this, this difference between issues arising out of um, dishonesty and, and neglect um, so the dishonesty issues, the criminality issues are, are not common, but they involve an enormous amount of regulatory resources. And when a lawyer behaves like a criminal, um, they're very hard to deal with um, because they have usually got 15 lawyer friends to help them and they've thought of all the manoeuvres way ahead of time. And that is an intensely resource heavy area of activity, whereas neglect and relationship breakdown involve a completely different skill mediating and attempting to produce a, um, an, a, um, a, an agreed outcome 
between the complaining client and their practitioner. And uh, often, if you can assist the lawyer, understand that we're not there to take their license from them if they've sworn at their client or they've extracted a complaint, um, attracted a complaint through delay or through miscommunication. If we can solve that problem by getting the lawyer to perhaps apologise or adjust the fees or transfer the file to the new solicitor without any drama, that's the role that we think we can usefully play rather than trying to judge those relationship breakdown matters. Um, the, a lot of the confusion for lawyers is about their, they, they're forgetting their, their duties um, to, their, to the court being primary uh, over their duties to their client. Um, we also you know, assist you know, in a pastoral sense to provide young lawyers but, and students and others to work out how to develop a lifetime um, um, role in professional services um, and to, um, uh, to, to, to deal with their communication needs. Communication is huge in legal regulation. Um, so if, if, if the complaint is not resolved, then my role is to either dismiss the complaint or to take it further and investigate the conduct. Major misconduct is always fully investigated and uh, if it's warranted, my role is to prosecute that practitioner at VCAT and, uh, and case four is an example um, of one of those prosecutions. We've got new legislation that um, purport and does reform the way regulation takes place um, between states. The politics didn't achieve a national scheme, but it achieved a sharing of, uh, of uh, regulation between Victoria and New South Wales, and that's, that, that involves a sharing of regulation um, between um, the two states that, that hold 73% of uh, licensed practitioners in Australia. And it's hoped that if Victoria and New South Wales can, um, can make uniform regulation work, that other states will be attracted to that as well. New powers are given. Uh, the Commissioner now has determination powers instead of just investigation powers where if I need to take any action, I have to apply to VCAT for orders. I now have determination powers. Um, and um, there is an increased threshold for the sorts of costs disputes I can deal with. Up until now, it's been limited to cost disputes and no more than $25,000, and that's been expanded to $100,000. And the Commission has given power to make orders relating to costs up to $10,000. Um, the Board's got expanded roles. It uh, doesn't just audit incorporated legal practices. It has the power to audit all legal practices. The Board mainly has been um, the regulator that deals with the individual practitioner and the individual practitioner's uh, license and their suitability to practice. Um, the area of intervening in a firm, putting them into receivership, is one exception where the board had a response and does have a responsibility to deal with the whole firm. But under the uniform law, the board is also given the responsibility to audit law firms to assess their um, their their systems of work, their um, management of staff, their service model, their communication, um, media, and those sorts of things. Um, the, the other thing that the changes do is deal with the issue of legal costs, which is a huge area of dispute. Um, the costs must be fair and reasonable, says the uniform law. You look at the skill and the complexity and the urgency and the quality of the um, work and the instructions given. Um, costs must be proportionate and reasonably incurred. Now you might say, well, isn't, isn't that precisely the way that law applies an assessment of the reasonableness of costs now? And it's largely reflective of the system that works now, um, but um, this is, um, is spelled out in the uniform law and, um, and involves uh, some, some new um, provisions relating to disclosure, costs of disclosure um, that um, allow for simplified written disclosure for any 
legal work that's going to be done about $750, uh, but a full written disclosure relating to costs if the fees are going to um, amount to higher than $3,000. And the consequence for failure to disclose involves um, the voiding of the costs arrangements um, and it can amount to misconduct. So there is an expanded area of work and, and development in the costs field um, and naturally my office uh, will be working very closely with both the costs court of the Supreme Court and the and VCAT which is the place so many of these issues are dealt with and, um, uh, and that will um, unfold as the, as the scheme proceeds. The scheme is planned to commence in early 2015. In a few weeks or a few days, there'll be an announcement about the appointment of a, um, a national council, which will coordinate the two states, and a national commissioner or a uniform commissioner whose responsibility is to um, harmonise the way the two states regulate. Uh, we've got identical legislation. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have identical rules created by the Legal Services Council um, and, and accordingly, um, lawyers and law firms working in both states will have a predictable, consistent, harmonious um, regulatory scheme rather than having to uh, comply one way in Sydney and a different way in Melbourne. In consumer matters, uh, there are two types of complaint created under the Uniform Scheme, consumer matters and disciplinary matters. I suppose you could say one might be around costs and relationship and the other might be around conduct. But in consumer matters, I have, the Commissioner has determination, determinative powers uh, uh, to provide imposed cautions, extract apologies, uh, direct a lawyer to redo the work. Now that'll be interesting. Uh, that'll be really hard to achieve, but I've got the power to direct them to redo the work. Um, what do you think, Judge? What's the chances? We'll see. Training, uh, don't require them to undergo supervision or tra training, um, or ordering them, the lawyer, to pay up to $25,000 compensation to their client. Um, in disciplinary investigations, that was too soon. In disciplinary investigations, um, the uh, Commissioner also has um, uh, powers to obtain search warrants and enter premises, um, which, are, which are new, um, can also impose cautions, apologies, require the lawyer to redo work, require them to undergo training, to be supervised, to reprimand them, or to pay a fine, um, not compensation, pay a fine of up to $25,000. Interestingly, um, the legislation says that sort of order from me um, is enforceable as a court judgment. Uh, so hopefully it gives some teeth to those sorts of um, areas. We talked about four types of cases that the board handles. Um, I'm only putting this screen up because it was in the age on the 13th of June, um, but um, uh, he, he, um, a fraudster lawyer called Philip Lineker, again, also has been publicised and, um, and is now notorious. For 25 years, ran a Ponzi scheme where um, he was offering fabulous interest to people, um, eight and then 10 and then 13%, sometimes even more, um, taking investment funds from clients, um, um, taking it from their, or putting it into trust, um, and uh, or saying he would put it into trust and stealing the money. In fact, robbing the next, the last person he promised to pay interest to um, with the new money he obtained from the next victim. So you, you probably know how Ponzi scheme work. Uh, you, you go to this person and you say, I'll get you 30% interest. In order, I never invested anywhere, but I take money from Samantha and your money goes to pay your interest and her interest, and then I need some more money to pay you two, so I, I go to the next person and keep on convincing them to hand money over. And that's what Mr. Mr. Lineker did. Um, a compensation, uh, that the, the law says that if you're 
trust funds are um, uh, lost due to fraud or dishonesty by your lawyer, you're um, entitled to claim compensation through the Fidelity Fund, uh, which is the fund managed by the Legal Services Board to meet compensation in these circumstances. And in this case, again, I'm taking this from um, public documents involving um, this incident, um, $140,000 was stolen by that corrupt solicitor from this person and um, he, he claimed a right to be compensated for that stolen money. But the law says um, that the Fidelity Fund doesn't pay compensation if the funds are uh, left with the, the practitioner for investment purposes. So it, it, it's obliged to pay compensation for funds placed in trust for legal services or for investments that are a, a natural consequence of the legal advice and the legal work being done. But leaving money with a lawyer in order to um, uh, invest funds in a, in a self-managed superannuation arrangement or invested in developments or invested in, in, in fabulous uh, activities um, is not protected by the board's fidelity scheme. And in this case, that claim was denied by the board. It was appealed, but the matter has uh, resolved amicably, amicably on confidential terms. But this, this is a neat case of the difficulty some people find themselves in leaving money with a solicitor, assuming that it's as safe as houses because the solicitor is trustworthy and there is a fidelity fund that will pay compensation if that money is lost. Um, it doesn't pay for all the money lost. Mr Coleman is a practitioner who attracted some interest from the Herald Sun on the 9th of October 2013. Um, and he was described as this Homer Simpson imposter. Um, and um, this case is about really inappropriately handling regulated property. Mr Coleman had, uh, was involved, he's a licensed practitioner, but he was involved in illegally claiming first home um, buyers grants um, under a number of pseudonyms, including a Homer Simpson name and uh, other names connected with um, some um, extraordinary films and, and, um, and, and other persons. Um, a, a trust account investigation uh, discovered serious financial irregularities with this person and the board therefore appointed a receiver to the firm and upon that occurring, Mr Coleman, the practitioner, relinquished his licence to practice. Um, but that didn't stop him from continuing to act for clients. So upon his firm being put into receivership, the law says you must not deal with any of that property. It's all regulated. Trust money, files, everything to do with the firm. Um, the night after the firm was put into receivership in a, a city office with uh, neighbouring businesses up and down the corridor, the roof tiles were, were displaced from outside in that room and outside in this room, and lo and behold, a whole lot of important files that have been locked, the receiver had changed the locks, um, locked up for the night, a whole lot of files disappeared over the roof. Um, and it, it happened that a lot of those ended up in a bonfire um, connected with Mr Coleman. He didn't burn them immediately, he kept acting for these clients while he was in receivership and after he had relinquished his licence. Um, he was uh, charged um, with um, offences, um, both connected with his behaviour under the Legal S Profession Act and also charged um, by the State Revenue Office for the fraud and theft connected with the Home Buyers Grant. Um, he was charged with offences by us related to interfering with regulated property and obstructing a receiver. He pleaded guilty. He was a very difficult, very difficult individual. But as often occurs at the day of reckoning, he pleaded guilty. Um, he, that prosecution, our prosecution, led to a um, nine months jail suspended for 18 months with a fine and uh, costs order. 
but the State Revenue Office prosecution led to a finding um, of um, guilt in relation to trust fraud, in relation to theft and obtaining financial advantage by uh, deception, and um, he is currently in jail, serving a five-year term. Charlatan fined over legal advice to racing legend Bob Jane. So this is about Malcolm McClure and his failure to have a licence to, to provide legal services. McClure acted for Bob Jane unlicensed. Um, you may have seen some publicity in the papers about Mr Jane's business dispute with his sons and their dispute over the ownership of the Bob Jane name and brand, etc. Um, Mr. Mr McClure um, inveigled himself into the trusted arms of Mr Jane, gave legal advice and lodged court documents, uh, worked very closely with Mr Jane. Um, uh, in a federal court dispute involving Mr Jane and Mr Jane's son, um, the, uh, the court imposed very expensive um, default orders on Mr Jane. Uh, Mr Jane had defaulted on the advice of this Mr McClure. In defending charges brought against him by the, by the board, he said, I never, I never said I was a lawyer. And of course it didn't matter because all of his conduct and actions revealed that he'd, 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 he'd acted, behaved as a, as, as a lawyer. You don't have to declare a, a sign on your forehead to say that you're a lawyer to be guilty of unqualified practice. Um, this man represented himself, as you would expect, um, at court. He, he argued um, the constitutionality basis of the prosecution, um, argued that the Legal Services Commissioner was running a cartel to keep good people out of the legal profession and away from assisting deserving people who needed their aid. Um, and so he vowed that he would, he would smash the cartel run by the Commissioner. Um, and on the first day of trial, um, he was ejected by the court over his extraordinary behaviour. And on the third day, he failed to appear. Um, and the a bench warrant was issued for his arrest. Um, but it, it went downhill from there. Um, and um, a couple of quotes from both the federal court proceeding and our own magistrates uh, finding Justice North in the federal court proceeding said in the documents he has drawn and his advocacy in the court, Mr McClure has demonstrated a complete lack of, lack of understanding matched only by his self-confidence and had said by his incompetence he has caused the parties to incur tens of thousands of unnecessary costs and the court described him as a persuasive charlatan and um, he was convicted in the magistrate's court following our prosecution um, and fined. And the last case involves, I apologise I didn't give you that slide, the last case involves um, a commissioner prosecution for misconduct. Now this is a very dramatic prosecution of misconduct, a lawyer barred and fined for secretly filming and sexually harassing a trainee. Uh, they're most rare cases and most of the misconduct cases that we investigate and prosecute involve, um, involve a conflict of interest, involve um, major failures uh, of ethics, but, but, but not in the, um, in, in the dramatic way this person failed to um, uh, remain or act as a fit and proper person. Um, he, he was the supervisor of a female trainee lawyer, um, and she needed 80, they were acquaintances um, over, uh, uh, from about, for about five years, she needed 80 days of training and he took her on, um, and on um, several occasions he misbehaved, but on the most significant occasion he locked her in the office and demanded sex 78 times. Um, and he showed her um, inappropriate photographs and videos um, of himself um, performing um, with others and he threatened her um, for um, 
uh, sex in exchange for him signing the papers that would be so important for her to complete her, her training. Not only did he deny that all of this occurred, but as as smart as you're thinking hmm, he should have been, he, he filmed, he secretly filmed the whole event in his office. That was presented to the court, of course, and uh, he came completely undone. Uh, so he, he was disqualified for eight months. He wasn't well, but that doesn't excuse the behaviour. Uh, he he, uh, he um, is, um, is in the hands of um, um, mental health professionals dealing with his, his other health issues, disqualified for eight months and required to pay compensation to her uh, um, of $100,000. So going back to that Aristotle point, uh, you know when to improvise and you do it in the cause of good. Um, how do we, what do we do, what should a good regulator do dealing with improvisation? Um, one of the things we do is we consult and we test our ideas. One of the things that we were never doing very well was putting firms in a manager under a manager. We had the powers to appoint a manager, but we mainly put put a firm into receivership, which is a very um, very final event. Usually it involves the, the winding up of the firm and the complete dismantling of the reputation and the practice itself. Um, whereas a managership puts them into the hands of someone, the hands of a trainer, and if the if the will is there and the and the and the capacity of the of the failing lawyers to um, to um, improve and reform their practice management style, then there's a potential for the firm to be restored to health and the managership shut down and return to the practitioners to continue providing adequate services for their clients. And we've really created a, a, a much more subtle environment involving intervening in dysfunctional firms rather than just shutting them all down. We've put a lot of effort into trying to manage them back to um, some form of um, recovery. We also fill gaps. For example, the legislation says a person is not fit and proper to hold a, a, a license, or may not be, um, if they're suffering from, from, from um, um, serious mental impairment. And there's for a long time a lot of uncertainty about what that means. There's, of depression amount to something that might disqualify you from uh, practicing. Um, we know uh, that one in five practitioners will experience um, a bout of mental illness through their in, throughout their or at, a, at at some time in their professional life. So it, it, it's very common. It's extremely manageable with modern medicine and and um, and a, a, a safe environment. Um, all of uh, the the, um, the anxiety and depression type illnesses are extremely um, manageable, and as we all know, um, hugely well functioning people in our lives um, perform uh, all of their um, responsibilities um, exceptionally well and manage their depression just like they might manage their physical illnesses while. Um, carrying on with life. So the board decided to impose a publisher guideline that indicated that we did not require practitioners to disclose to the board that they were suffering from a mental illness unless it was not being managed or unless it was um, uh, incapacitating them for their work. Um, and we hope by filling that gap even though the legislation didn't quite deliver that language, filling that gap um, was a good thing. Uh, because while there's a secret, that is, while, while a, a, a lawyer has not disclosed to the regulator that they are suffering from a mental illness, then they're not going to disclose to their family, their friends and their doctors, which are the people they do need to reveal their ill health to in order to get it managed. So to lift the voodoo off not telling the regulator, which most people didn't, we only heard that people were depressed and anxious and suffering from mental illness when they, you know, when they were being investigated 
or when they were presenting evidence to, um, in, in mitigation over charges that might have been laid over misconduct events, etc. So that's an example of where we've, we've talked about. Another is to take criticism. A, a good regulator's got to hold the mirror up to themselves and say, how are we performing? How does the consumer environment, the client environment, um, all of the other um, entities that depend on us and the legal profession perceive us? Are we, uh, um, are we uh, able to improve our operations? And one of the big frights for the Commissioner's Office about six years ago involved an ombudsman's report that said we were not performing adequately. We were slow, we were uncommunicative, we were locked into um, black letter legal approaches, we were, um, we, we were uh, sort of self-possessed without being able to reform or self-reflect. Um, and so taking criticism and fixing your own house uh, is a very good place for an integrity regulator to start, especially because there's a risk that you can believe, well, because you're supposed to be judging everyone else, um, you shouldn't be subject to judgment yourself. And that's not true. And expect some setbacks. Um, uh, accept that if we apply delay to our operations, we could be um, penalised in the outcome we get through the courts, by the courts looking at the regulator and suggesting that harm might have been done to the person being prosecuted by the delay involved in the investigation and the prosecution. Um, so that covers the, uh, the um, material I wanted to impart to you today. Um, and I think, Samantha, I ought to ask people if they would like to uh, comment or ask any questions. About 10 minutes. One of the important roles we play as a regulator is working very closely with the professional associations. So some of the functions we perform are delegated to the bar and the Law Institute um, to share in aspects of regulation, trust investigations by the Law Institute, incorporated legal practice auditing. Uh, so they do that. We, the board pays them to perform a delegation and they effectively operate as the, as the board. The bar regulates um, through its ethics committee, so complaints are investigated and, um, and recommendations back to me emerge from work that the bar does through its ethics committee and, it, and the bar office also deals with the licensing of, of, um, of barristers and um, the oversight and delivery of um, continuing professional development. We do a bit of both, Samantha. I mean, the rules of conduct for barristers and for solicitors are the guidebook for the way in which a, um, a practitioner is to behave, um, and sometimes it's, it's prescriptive. For example, you've got uh, this type of document that you've got to provide to your client, this list of information you've got to provide to your client when you're disclosing costs, um, and failure to meet that, that disclosure um, obligation can amount to a, a, a disciplinary breach or misconduct. So that um, those rules of behaviour are the sort of a, a measure they're intended to be um, protective in that a lawyer thoroughly familiar with those rules um, probably won't get too many things wrong. Um, but where they do, the breaches of those rules um, are the, the things we look to where the evidence exists to mount a, an unsatisfactory um, professional conduct or misconduct charge. But the other role that I see the regulator playing is in the pastoral sense. That is, in giving and taking away license every year, licenses every year, the board's got power to impose conditions on licenses, to identify certain elements of failure or, or certain shortcomings that are not misconduct, they don't attract charges, but they require the license to limit the activities or the functions of the, of the licensed practitioner or require the practitioner to do things that uh, other practitioners don't have to do. An example of the conditions that we've imposed this year on some practitioners is that they must um, appoint a, a practice manager to advise them how to run their high street practice. Um, 
what we're seeing frequently in this state, and it'll be all over the place, is that where the flood of graduates from the university are not able to get the um, jobs in um, the high employing firms, um, they're resorting to running their operation from high street with very good lawyers. Um, they're shocking practice managers, shopping, shocking business people, and uh, and they need not they don't need policing, they need help. And so we see ourselves as being relevant in that area as well, um, uh, attempting to catch the stumbling practitioner um, and help them save themselves before they get into trouble. So it's both, um, I think a bit of both of the, of the, um, the two contrasting points you made. I wonder, do you think that the new power which will get out of the rules resulting much change in the number of times you need to go to the weekend or the courts. So do you think it would be the thing or otherwise? Yeah, thanks, Judge. Yes, it, it would, I believe that um, we'll push through a lot more um, uh, cases but deal with them in-house. So a, a lot of the complaints, the costs complaints and the smaller conduct complaints um, are in the in the lower order of, um, of um, Misbehaviour or, um, or confusion and, and, and failure over cost disclosure, and um, we believe that by being able to um, uh, clear out a lot of those um, uh, lower order complaints, um, a lot less prosecutions will end up in VCAT. The consequence will be that I, I will become a tribunal against uh, uh, whom many appeals will be launched and they'll probably end up in your hands, Judge. Uh, but we do see the um, the new provisions as, a, as enabling faster turnover and, um, and, um, and simpler um, 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 uh, solutions to um, some of the complaints and some of the problems that consumers uh, feel. Um, so, um, much of the um the role of the commissioner, sorry, the commissioner and board seems to be related to um, lawyers in private practice in, in firms. What role does the commissioner, the board, or indeed the, the professional associations have with lawyers who are in corporate environments, acting as corporate counsel, company secretaries, or any other role within a, you know, you know, um, in other organisation, you know, um, commercial organisation? We regulate corporate lawyers, but you'll be very pleased to know there's hardly any cases involving misconduct by corporate lawyers. Um, there are some um, uh, involving government lawyers. Um, for example, someone got a job with one of the um, prosecution agencies in this state um, and made up a whole lot of lies about their background and their uh, previous work experience and their, um, their uh, CV was doctored. Um, but corporate lawyers um, uh, hardly ever feature on our radar. And I should say, the demographic for a complaint to the commissioner is a 50-year-old male in the suburbs. And it's not because 50-year-old males are you know, sh shockers, but it's because um, complaints are very common and, and, and a normal part of professional service life. And I tell students to prepare yourself for complaints. The test about whether you're a good lawyer is not, not whether you've been complained about. It will be common and it will be manageable. The test of a good lawyer in private practice and dealing with the public is how they respond to complaints. Um, because most complaints are not um, license-threatening complaints. Most complaints are soluble. And the firms down this street and down that street spend thousands of hours dealing with client complaints, not because they're rotten lawyers, but because they're typical and common, but they solve their complaints because they have a staff partner, so they remove the emotion from the person who's complained about. They make decisions about what, what's important for them. Is preserving our relationship with our client important? If it is, they usually 
apologise and give some money back. Um, but what happens in um, in other firms, usually when they complain to the commissioner, they've been three times back to their high street lawyer to say, I don't like the fee, your service is shabby, and why won't you answer the phone anymore? And they get exasperated and they complain to us. And so there are often signals to a, uh, any practitioner um, that there's, there's something wrong with the relationship. Some practitioners refuse to deal with them or don't have the... They're, they're, not in, they're not healthy enough, they're unwell, they're depressed, they procrastinate. The reason why the complaints come in is because they're not managing their own services. They might have been an excellent lawyer for 20 years. Suddenly they're, they're, you know, they're not well or they're prone to arguing. They're prone to um, not seeing the, the problem the way their client wishes to see it. And they um, attract a complaint that comes to them. <coughs> so um, there would be complaints involving corporate lawyers, government lawyers, and and commercial lawyers. Um, so many of them are handled properly in-house. And uh, so um, uh, that, that's what we do with corporate lawyers. Um, look, it just reminds us how crucial the role of the Legal Service Commission is. Um, you know, as lawyers, we enter into a profession. We have professional standards and ethics to uphold. And we're very fortunate to have a board that, and, and, and basically an integrity board that oversees that. And it was really fascinating to listen to the role of the board and to see how that operates tonight. So thank you very much. Please join your hands in thanking me.